I do think of dealing with Guardians of the Galaxy as being on untrammeled snow. And the first thing that excited me about Guardians, before any story elements or anything else, was actually creating the visual look. And the very first thing I did was I sat down and wrote a 19-page document that was called The Look of Guardians of the Galaxy. And it really was about creating a space opera that brought color back to these types of movies. There were a lot of things in that document that I adhered to, having a sort of postmodern aesthetic in terms of having a lot of contrast throughout the film, something very beautiful next to something very ugly. Morag is one of the places we see this most clearly. We have this very dour, ugly landscape and these beautiful skies, although they're storm-filled skies, they're beautiful. Morag is this planet that was completely flooded and it's drained away, but that was still a very light, sandy environment, so it's quite a, a neutral color palette. And then you go into this secret vault and suddenly you're into this vivid gold, green and blue, dual light -like world, so the color kicks off quite quickly. It's like living in a, an amazing life-size fish tank, but with no water. A little inside, uh, inside tip from movie making. You never want to submerge everything in water, especially the crew and the actors. Morag sets up a lot of the look of the movie in terms of having technology that's mixed with something very ancient, so they have a very ancient temple that's obviously very old, but around that, it's a pretty forward, progressive society that we see when Quill uses his map gun. And so it was really setting up all those different tones in that one scene. And likewise, I think, tonally, Morag sets up a lot of what is to come in the movie because we have this seemingly very serious, dour situation that this guy who could be a human, could be a robot, we're not even sure what he is at first, finds himself in, and then very quickly we're, you know, attached back to Earth through the music playing. The contrast of the 1970s pop song playing while he's dancing through this very dark, evil-looking temple. Having the music on standby and understanding what's gonna be playing is really helpful because it takes the pressure off. A movie like this is so much more than just acting. I mean, every set is a giant set. All the costumes of the aliens, of the extras, all of the music, the score, the visual effects. It's like this world is created. So when you hear the music and you get a sense of what's gonna be playing at the time, you think, oh, the pressure's off. I can just be myself and be present in this moment and, and it'll work. Okay, that's, that's good. Right up there. I think we got it, yeah. Although, if I have to hear the Pina Colada song one more time, I'm gonna lose it. <laughs> Xandar is this sort of utopian society. Everyone's really smart and thoughtful and progressive, and it's futuristic, but not like lame futuristic where they're all wearing like shiny tinfoil outfits. There's a lot of different alien races. There's like people who are completely pink and yellow and blue. If you'd have been in my shoes and walked in on the first day that I was here and saw all the concept artwork on the walls, mind-blowing. Being in outer space, that's a serious situation. James's uh, ideas are pretty funky and out there, but he wanted everything to look grounded. We had to be really careful. We weren't putting uh, antennae on heads and things like that, so it's too silly. It has to look believable. I think that people do sense the fact that the world building goes pretty deep. We discussed a lot about the different cultures, where they came from, who they are, what's important to them. We don't really mention Krylorians much in the movie. They're the pink people. But we have a lot of things in documents about who the Krylorians are and where they came from and what's important to them. And that was important in creating them on screen. And I think when you get to that type of specificity throughout the film, it just creates an environment that seems more real. And we have a lot more to talk about. You know, when we're talking about the way the suns move in Xandar and the three suns, and that's where the three lights, the oculites on the Nova Core come from. That, that is their suns, that's their symbol. That's what sets them apart. All those things are very important to these cultures and 
to where they came from and where they're going. It was kind of daunting, to be honest. It took us a while because the color palette that James is using is pretty extreme. We got vivid colors. To turn them into humanoid aliens and, and so forth is quite difficult. It took a lot of testing to get the right tones and to make it believable. It was challenging because we were trying to find the right green for Gamora that wouldn't put people off, but it was also vibrant and kind of youthful and it would engage people but without losing the element that she is an alien, she's not a Terran. I was very inquisitive about the fact that I would have to go through four to five hours of makeup every morning because um, I'd never had that experience. I always like to do new things. The stuff that they can do now with makeup is just amazing. My makeup's pretty dramatic, but it's just so cool. I mean, when we first started, it was about four and a half hour application. The bad thing about it is, is I can't sit while we're doing it. Sometimes I have a little perch and I lean on it. They have these two sticks that they have and they have tennis balls on top of them. And that's what I grab and perch my arms up on. Drax, he, he's tattooed from head to toe. He has a gray base to him and his tattoos are kind of red. Now we went for keloid scarring, which is a kind of a technique used in uh, you know, tattooing your own skin. And it's actually raised, so it's a few mil above the surface of your, your skin layer. And in 3D, when you see that come towards you, it's really quite vibrant and quite interesting because it's very, very different. We took a full body cast. We then went into molding it and then we went into sculpting all the pieces, breaking them down individually uh, and creating the makeup itself. It took a while because there's stories to be told in the keloid scarring. So we had to kind of get James around and he would look at it and we'd, we'd change the angle where things were going to be, you know, what the story has to say, making sure that it said the right thing. And then when we finished it and put it on David himself, it looked terrific. That's part of what we're doing here. The makeup is a big, major part of the film. The makeup itself is maybe five or six layers of different combinations of colors and it takes probably all total three hours, three and a half hours maybe. The textures and just the depth, it's real. It looks absolutely like this is real skin. That's the thing, I mean, you just can't argue with it, you know, the finished product because it looks so good. It's like, it's just totally worth it. So today we are in the kiln. This is the uh, outer space prison system filled with corrupt guards and the Guardians of the Galaxy, before they're the Guardians of the Galaxy, are sent here to do time. And we're shooting one big massive shot that goes all the way up and follows our characters and goes around the whole prison. And it's uh, the biggest shot of my life, quite frankly, and it should be a lot of fun. And this set is intense. You could really house like 160 prisoners here and I've never seen anything like this. This is one of our larger sets in the film. The set comprises of three different levels. You'll see a lot of blue screen up here, so actually in the wide shots, we'll extend the set up maybe another couple of hundred feet. It's slightly unusual because of its uh, structure. We had to basically build the whole thing out of steel, but that sort of, I hope, gives it a reality as well. Of the kiln. We've looked at a lot of these different prisons all around the world and how they act and what they're like and how they're different from prisons in, in Britain or, or the US to be able to sort of intermingle like those different looks and create our own look, I think was very important from the beginning. The kiln was very much a, a grungy, dirty, toxic land. So anything we produced for that had the you know, grimy feel to it. It's dark and dank, and you can almost smell how nasty it is when you're there. It's a rough place to be. This is like the delousing process, I think. This is what you have to do when you go to prison. It's not good. Don't break the law. We work really closely with James on this, as we do, you know, with all of the sets, and also with Previs. Previs then takes our model and starts to actually build the action sequence within that. Then James would come in and say, OK, well, I definitely need this gantry at this height for this particular sequence. I need that cell there. Obviously, the tower itself is a very specific thing. So, you know, even the little junction box that Groot gets to, that had to be at a particular height. 
because we're always working with a virtual character. So we need to know exactly where that little box needs to be because he can only he grows to a certain height. So we're always working within a quasi sort of virtual real space. Here's the thing. It's a lot easier to do spaceships flying and crashing into each other than it is to have a bunch of aliens that aren't there walking and talking and having a conversation, especially if they're not walking in a complete straight line. It's the most complicated scene we've shot. It is a little weird sometimes, you know, just kind of looking into nothing. It's just like one point and you're looking at it and you're supposed to act in and talking to. I have to say that Sean Gunn, who's playing Rocket here in the movie as we're filming, has made it super easy. This one here is our booty! He grabs the gun, right? Yep. Looks up there, sees his opportunity. These guys know what they're doing. Creepy little beasts. Creepy little beasts! Throws him the gun. The gun swirls through the air in slow motion. Rocket grabs it. Boom. Oh. oh. Oh, yeah. And then he begins to circle around and shoot all of the robots with his machine gun because Dad Raccoon is good with firepower. I think that Charlie Wood and I, for the first time we sat down and we talked, we understood, you know, exactly where each other were coming from and what this movie was, was capable of being. And I think we've been able to achieve that. We just wanted to sort of create something which wasn't just necessarily a default position of just being dark and dismal. We wanted to sort of give this space and character because it's full of so many characters. It's kind of relaxing, actually. It's not bad. Nowhere, to me, was one of the most fun locations to deal with. One of the whole central thrusts of Guardians is that we have these five characters who are mortal at play in the fields of gods. And when we come upon the giant head of the Celestial, we realize that there are gigantic players in this cosmic field. And it is really based in the Celestials of Marvel Comics. These carriers can use this stone to mow down entire civilizations like wheat in a field. The Collector has been collecting for a long time, species of all manners, antiques, everything. He's kind of like Noah from Noah's Ark. He believes that there's going to be a big catastrophe in the galaxy and the whole universe. And he's collecting all these creatures to preserve them somehow. So there's an element of altruism. But his ways of collecting might not be the best ways. My favorite Easter egg of all is uh, when you first walk into the Collector's Museum and we push in on Benicio as he turns towards us with those ridiculous glasses. Overhead, you'll see Howard the Duck in a tiny little glass box. But there's all sorts of fun things in there, from Cosmo the dog, obviously, who's a guardian in the comic books, to uh, a frost giant to uh, my slugs from Slither, Dark Elves, and all sorts of different characters. It's cool to have those references there for comic book fans to sort of track down and find.
I took a lot of time planning out the third act. I took a lot of time shooting the third act, and I took a lot of time editing the third act. It was a arduous process, but I think in the end worthwhile. The final battle is pretty much a, a smorgasbord of everything and more. Everything is there. Everybody has to have a moment to shine, and also you have to believe they're not going to make it. The universe is a very dangerous place. It's a very wild place full of conflict. And Ronan the Accuser is a strong force in that. He's a bad, bad guy. And all of that force and brutality is an engine towards very destructive end. That's what he's trying to bring about in this movie, is the end of days, when all the weak sink to the bottom and perish, and all the strong rise to the top and flourish. Santa, you stand accused. We have this aerial fight that needs to happen with uh, necrocrafters and pods and the Milano and jets and the Dark Aster, which is a gigantic, gigantic piece out there in the sky. Just about everything that we did had to be touched by the visual effects team. My spaceship, it was like heavy cement and metal. It's massive. They say it's the size of the Empire State Building turned over on its side 11 times. I love the design of my ship. I think it's awesome. <laughs> the journey was, well, if we can't take it down by blowing it up with one thing, what could be the thing that these Nova jets could do? So they created an energy field. The Nova net is something that I drew as shots before I wrote it as words. And I thought of what that visually would be and how those things would link up together and how we could give the Nova Core some awesome power that would be unique and different from things that we had seen before. This is the moment where it all starts going down. How you doing? I'm Chris Pratt here on the set of Guardians of the Galaxy. Behind me, the Xandar crash site. There's fire back there, but don't worry, we've got firemen here, which has been a real treat for, for all the ladies. It's super intense and dirty and smoky, and everybody is having a blast. We're doing what appears to be an epic dance battle, your standard action dance-off. Let's do a dance-off! In the end, we decide to essentially sacrifice ourselves for the greater good of other people. That's really the journey of the group. You're immortal! How? Set it yourself, bitch. We're the guardians of the galaxy. started to build into this universe, and that was something that excited me about creating these characters in the first place, and that we can get to know all of these characters more. And to not be, frankly, tied to the superhero concept, because at the heart of this story is not a superhero story. We aren't a superhero story at all. We're a space epic. I have some really great ideas about where these characters are gonna go. I'm walking out of this interview and walking over to Kevin Feige's office to tell him what I want to do with the sequel. I'm excited to deal with uh, Rocket and Groot and Drax and Gamora and Quill again. If there is no jeopardy, then there's no emotional connection to it. And the fact is that Groot does sacrifice himself for his friends in this ultimate 
way of saying we are family. I thought there was something interesting about that. I thought that this character has the potential to touch people in a way, to reach people in a way that none of the other characters I've ever played before have. No, Groot! You can't. You'll die. Which is, for me, is one of the most emotional places in the entire film. We are Groot. It's beautiful, it's sad, and it's an ending of that character, or so you believe. Well, there's two baby Groots. There's the first baby Groot, which is basically a stick with a face. I actually love that baby Groot. And then there's the later baby Groot, which is a little bit more cute. By the time we designed Baby Groot, we had already shot the movie. And I mean, that scene was in the script of Baby Groot dancing. But we hadn't designed Baby Groot, and it was after we had come back from London. By that time, our, our, our design team knew exactly the kind of thing I was looking for, and I described it pretty well. And it didn't go through too many iterations before we got to the Baby Groot that's on screen. It feels like the audience is going to be with Groot for a long time. What is cooler than that?